Do you have a current bio that you're happy with? A short little thing? No, not really. I you okay. mean, I usually I go with just the name, you know, that I found at the press with Gary and that I uh, really like books. <laughs> Spent a lot of time reading, writing, designing, typesetting. <laughs> Very good. Marketing, <laughs> selling books. Yeah, so the only difference between us is you actually do something about it. I just like to talk about it. <laughs> I don't know. You... <laughs> I would say you're several steps better than just talking about it. <laughs> well, I do like to buy them, too. That's I right. love to collect right. them. You're right. Okay, so welcome, Andrew, again to the Bibliophile. Yeah, thanks, Nigel. It's been about a dozen years, so it's a good time to you, check in. You can see on the floor, the, 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 you would have sat on this side of the wall oh, the last yes. time, and now you can see where the paint line, where the wall came down. Right. <laughs> <laughs> And now what am I, I'm looking at all sorts of lovely uh, silvery... Uh, Those are shavings from the back of linotype slugs. Uh, Glenn Galuska's linotype, which now lives here uh, arm's length from my desk. <laughs> so I figure, you know, I figured if I put it that close to my desk, I was going to use it more frequently than if I tucked it in the back of the shop somewhere. <laughs> it's a beautiful looking machine too. You got it. You got it nice and oiled up. Too. Oh, it's you know necessary to keep them clean. The dust is the enemy of a, a you know a linotype machine. It's good at running. So yeah, it's they're just they're gorgeous, complicated. It's like a, if if watches did not have cases and you just looked at the watch, guts it all all the time. It's it's uh, what the linotype is. It's just a lot of moving parts. Do you collect anything around linotype, like uh, manuals and stuff? I like do that? try to collect yeah. like specimens and manuals, and and uh, you know, their German and English ones are different, and and uh, uh, you know, British and America is different, and 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 matrices, of course, you know, to run on them, the, the different typefaces. So um, again, I, I it's it's a very much a working collection. I I don't run off over uh, looking for obscurities that I I won't use or don't love. I would say maybe a third of my collection came from Glenn. So they're things that he would have collected through the 80s and 90s and uh, out of Toronto and Montreal. And the, some came out of a shop in North Carolina and some I've just bought here and there, you know, either from people like Don Black or, or other private individuals, you know, who, who uh, had different type faces for the machine. So Now, when we talked uh, 12 11, years... 11, 12 years ago. Yeah, yeah. we concluded with, uh, and I think I was talking a little faster back then. <laughs> we probably both were. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, hopefully, uh, yeah, so the interviews are a bit longer now. <laughs> they're leisurely. They're leisurely. Yes, yes. More room for the listener. <laughs> your advice to your children was to pay attention, to care, to create, to make things. I just wonder uh, if that still stands. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And they're all now, you know, in their in their 20s. Uh, my oldest son just got married. My daughter has had a, and her partner have had a child. Uh, my youngest boy is in university, you know, so they're all edging into adulthood and finding their way and and it's delightful to see that they are doing those things in their way. I had forgotten that that interview ended on that note. My memory, of course, of that interview is that we just talked about the sentimentalists, which I was sick of talking about. <laughs> right, right. Well, uh, and I think I made the large claim that it would be one of the great books to go after for Canadian collectors because of all of the all the controversy and stories around it. So, uh, well, you may yet be true. Uh, I may, I may yet, <laughs> yeah. I, I know that it's very difficult to find a first printing yeah. of that for sure. Yeah. Um, and it did win the Giller and the Alcune Award. So, you know, the, yeah. it's got the design award. Okay. So we've established the fact that paying attention and that, what, what exactly does that mean? paying attention well being interested in inhabiting your own life i think largely i mean our world is so full of ways of distracting ourselves from i don't know the day-to-day -day, you know from our own uh, environment you can go for a run 
and you put in the earbuds and suddenly you're in a Nashville studio listening to someone. You're not in the space that you're in. And so paying attention, I think, is, is I think, first and foremost, starts there by just being present in your in your own environment and with the people around you and uh, investing not, and caring in them. Yeah, I find that I have difficulty because I'm always thinking of stuff. So I'm always off in some idea rather than... Well, that's okay. That's still being, you know, a way it, of paying attention, a way of being present. I mean... It's still rooted in your life, right? It is, but it means that I forget my keys quite Oh, well, <laughs> that's a whole other matter. <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it also extends outwards into um, being aware of and alert to the people around you and your community and what your community's needs are, being invested in, in, what, in the goings-on and wanting to be a part of, of, of those things. Mm-hmm. It's a piece of advice I often give younger writers, you know, when they come in. People are not always younger, but new writers. People are starting to think about how do you do this trick. And, you know, you can't write if you're not living, if you're not, if you're not invested in your day-to-day and the people around you. In the details. That's right. That is the, the, the minutia is what we're built out of. We're tiny little atoms bouncing around, you know, a lot of water molecules. Like, it's all about the details. It, 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 well, and also in any kind of conversation that I conduct. What's interesting is is the details. But it's also, you know, the, the neglect of the details is what allows great indifference and, and, and injustice, ultimately. If you're not thinking about what it's like to be the person standing beside you, then you mm-hmm. can, you can uh, treat them less somehow. If you, if you can't tell the difference between a birch tree and a maple tree, then you probably don't care whether they get cut down. So the, paying attention has this, it, it's a piece of universal advice, you know. It, like when my... Kids were small, and I would take other people's kids with me canoeing, and and you'd take maybe one of the parents. The other parents were always a pain in the ass because they, they would want to make a lot of rules, you know. So the kids don't don't do that, don't don't don't, mm-hmm. you know. And so I would always try to shut it down right away by declaring with great theater to the other children: "There's only two rules when you're canoeing with me. One rule is respect." which covers a lot of things, you know, whether you leave the stick in the fire or you wave it in the air, whether you play with a knife or you don't, whether you, you know, respect covers a lot of ground. Basically, it's a, another way of saying pay attention. But the second rule was no drowning um, for comic <laughs> relief, of course, yes. you know, <laughs> but, but, you know, it's, it's this universal piece of advice. I think that so much would fix so much if we would just have empathy, if we would just pay attention, if we would yeah. invest of ourselves and inhabit our own lives. And a lot of this nonsense that we deal with would not happen. <laughs> Respect is at the base of any kind of relationship. Yeah. Because it's an acknowledgement of our responsibility to one another, mm-hmm. which is what all communities hinge upon. Is that, you know, not, you know, right now, well, in these post-pandemic or near post-pandemic times, I mean, with a lot of talk of freedom and uh, and people's rights being curtailed, you know, people being upset about that. But everyone wants to talk about rights and no one wants to talk about responsibilities to each other. And, you know, we, and these things are always in balance. Mm-hmm. They, so they just sort of don't exist without the other. One doesn't exist without the other. Okay, speaking about one thing, relying upon another. In publishing, there is selecting the right text, a good text, and then there is presenting it. Mm. Uh, I want to dwell on the presenting it, but I do want to touch on selecting the right text. And before we started taping, we talked about... It's my, my dad's clock. <laughs> Lovely. My late father. Yeah. yeah, this isn't that. We're on the half hour there, are we? I think it's on the quarter. Oh, that's actually. the quarter? We'll okay. mark, our, mark the interview. <laughs> Six or seven of those later. That's right. Uh, we talked about wanting to keep reading. Mm. That, that's the criteria that I use as a reader. If after, it used to be after 50 pages. Now it's more like, five pages. Mm-hmm. Is that what you use as a criteria? It's certainly one of the criteria, and I think like, the one that everything hinges on ultimately is, you know, if I don't care, why would I expect anyone else to care? Or why would I invest in this this work? 
Yeah. Um, and you invest more than most because of the nature of your publishing firm. From a personal standpoint, I, I think that's true. I mean, um, you know, the, the, there's often a division between selecting the work and then presenting the work, as you describe it. And here that, you know, I think in a lot of smaller firms, but in particular in a firm like ours, that line is, is disappears you know, ultimately. You know, whereas in, in our case, the person who is selecting the work, me, is also the person who is, you know, designing the work, uh, you know, editing the work before that, and doing some portion of printing and binding of the work often um, in in concert with the other players here at the press. So yes, you're you're invest, you're very much invested. You know, I, I like to talk about publishing like the kind of publishing I do is is publishing with a capital P. Um, but there's lots of other ways to do publishing that, that don't have the heart uh, that this does or it doesn't have the same mission or mandate that this does. Or, 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 or the work. Or the, well, for that too, yeah. So it is possible, I think, to, to break those things up and to be calculating. And you hope that somebody in that chain of tasks you know, uh, has some love for the work beyond the kind of, you know, well, boxing books are hot right now or right. whatever. <laughs> um, wrestling, wrestling, wrestling books. books are hot. Right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was for you, Jack. That, that was definitely for, we were both thinking about Jack. Yeah. David, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in, a, in, a, in a smaller enterprise like this, you know, where these things are of a piece and you are making books, you know, because it gives you pleasure to do so, but also because you believe in the kind of thing the kind of tool that a book is in a community and what what thing it can do in a culture, you know, how it can uh, shepherd ideas through time, how it can sort of sit quietly and wait like an improvised explosive device, you know, like, yeah, you know, all of these kinds of things that a book can do um, that that all so many of the other very nifty and useful uh, gadgets we have now uh, don't do as well. I mean, they do other things well, but they don't do that as well. If you are invested in those things and you think they have a value um, and are part of the, what makes your community healthy, then then you really do take seriously that that responsibility of being moved by what you're reading and what you're deciding to publish, of actually caring about it. I would say that probably one of the most common lines that I write in, in rejection letters when trying to explain when I'm writing uh, letters back to authors about books I'm not going to take, I'm often making a comparison uh, and simply explaining it's not my job to decide what books are good and not good ultimately. I mean, as a reader, I'm welcome to do that. But as a publisher, it's not really my job. My job is to pick a dozen good books to publish next year that fit our program, that I can serve well, and that I think will serve the community well. So in explaining mm. to an author that I'm not taking the You books, just said good books. Did I? Yes. Okay. There's this sort of faux pressure to have the book, right? Okay. You know, the winner for this, the best yeah. book. Well, but your version, book, I mean, it's subjective. That's what we're saying. Well, there's always some subjectivity, absolutely. But um, there are some. there is objectivity, I think, also possible in assessing things that have merit or not merit yeah. you know um, yeah. there is better and worse oatmeal nigel <laughs> it's not all subjective yeah. and and no amount of maple syrup will make bad oatmeal good oatmeal well no i would say that there's oatmeal that more people think is good than than people think is bad that's okay. uh, marketing <laughs> that is marketing but again <laughs> the the designation of best is subjective in a context of objectivity but yeah, like these things are yin and yang in, in the thing. I, 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 I always get cagey whenever um, anyone tries to paint anything in the arts as completely subjective. Um, mm -hmm. It's not that simple. I mean, there yeah. is, yeah. there there are, uh, at the end of the day, well, we all choose what we wish to spend our time on and uh, and what we choose to value. But there are objective measures of, of form and of structure and of humor to some extent even. I mean, like all of these kinds of things, there are ways to look and sort of dissect and say, here's why this is a stronger uh, made thing or, you know, than this made thing. So I, 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 I get cagey when we try to take that utterly out and just make it all subjective. Yeah. Well, Everything it's like someone who has expertise, someone who has read this kind of book all their life. Mm. 
and they they say this is the best of that yeah. grouping and someone who hasn't read anything but knows what they like and what they don't like mm. and those are useful you know things to try to understand like to try to understand one's subjectivity and try to master one's objectivity but at the end of the day all readers are simply responding you know and and they may not all respond to the, to the objectively best thing they may respond to the thing that reminds them of their grandfather or of their yeah. of a dog they loved or whatever it is you know like mm-hmm. i'm not it's not always sentimental but you know they really like red cars <laughs> you know like it's yeah. it's nothing about red that's special it's just they like the red cars mm-hmm. so so there is um always that element but cycling back to where I started before we wandered into this was the the line that I often write is one of this work simply didn't excite me as much as others that were offered or didn't interest me as much as others that were offered. That's a very honest and yet still kind of a broad and general line, but it's very, it's, it's absolutely the truth. I mean, I, I see hundreds of books that could be published every year mm-hmm. and I pick 12. I, long ago decided to take the pressure off myself of picking the right 12 um, and decided to pick the 12 that interested me. And hopefully those 12 will keep you in oatmeal. <laughs> yes, and maple syrup, if I'm lucky. <laughs> yeah, okay. it, you know, like, it, so this, when you said, um, asked whether it was a, this was a you know, criteria, like that, that you, you kept reading, that it drew you in. The other criteria are usually uh, there are three general criteria that I'm thinking about. One is is that do I care about this book? Do I love this book? Do I, is it, does this book move me? Another one is can I sell it? You know, yeah. like that, yeah. right? Like that's ultimately what we do. I, I don't uh, make books to store. I make books to to go out there and make trouble in the world. So, can I can I find an audience for this book? Which is I think an important question. But I'm also trying to understand whether the author and their text are a fit here. Whether the thing that we do and the way that we do it will be a good home for that author and what they need in this book and what it needs. So it, what is so no what's good, that criteria then? Well, it, it, you know, are they someone who understands the scale that we're interested in, the way that we work? It's no good coming here and having us sign your book and to believe that we're going to behave you know, and it's not just about economics or size, but that we're going to behave in the way that, say, you know, Random House will behave. That that we're going to pursue the same things, the same goals. You know, ultimately, we all want to sell books to the right readers. Um, I'm not sure that Random House cares about whether it's the right reader. I think that they're just interested in selling to readers, yeah. any readers. Yeah. You know, they're just whoever. Profit. So it, it's a kind of shotgun approach where we're much more sharpshooters, I think, in some ways. So that's what I mean by that, that you're... you're, you're there are books that don't belong. And a more obvious level is somebody who's written, you know, the memoir of their grandfather in the Cameron Highlanders regiment. You know, they're going to do better uh, having that book privately printed and selling it at the farmer's market. They're going to make more money. They're going to find the right audience. They know that audience. They don't need us. They don't need us in that mix. Mm-hmm. And we may give them the best advice we can give them. We may even offer to do printing for them. But as a publisher, they don't need us. On the other end, someone that comes to me with the, you know, the celebrity train your dog book could sell millions, but it's not going to be the right thing here. It's, mm. it's not. So know, what's the right thing? We're largely publishing poetry and fiction and nonfiction, you know, in a literary vein here. That That's that's a, a very general answer, I realize. But but so we're working in that 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 broader Canadian tradition of small, small presses. But I have a particular interest in, you know, when I sort of tried to figure out what the organizing principle is of nearly 25 years of publishing here, it's, it's back to that paying attention thing. It's back to, um, I'm interested in people who are able to talk, able to, to write and communicate about um, the experience of being in a community, not to say my community here, but, 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 you know, uh, succinctly and in an interesting way in a way that kind of builds up challenges um these are things that interest me so not place in the kind of no no any kind of place any right kind of, but but the, but ultimately um most of the when i look at the books a strong element in the majority of them would be a strong sense of place and a strong sense of community whichever place or community it happens to be right um 
Because I think that that, that location of oneself, that understanding, you know, sometimes working with or working against the realities of that place, is um, you know, an essential part of that paying attention that I'm so interested in. Okay. <laughs> so it's easy to pay attention to the look of your books because nice they're segue. so <laughs> because they are so damn not just beautiful they do all the the, the right things uh, in terms of presentation so maybe that's where we should start well, I, what I think, are the right things? Well, I think I think that that's I'm I'm happy that that you've expressed it that way. Most people stop at just saying they're beautiful, which is a kind of shortcut. And um, but actually, what they are is they have the kind of fitness to purpose. You know what I've always tried to do. I think of someone like the folk singer Gillian Welsh. I don't know that you know her music, but she has spent her career writing songs that sound like they came out of the Appalachian that they had just have always been and could not be otherwise. And when I'm trying to design a book, I have the advantage of having edited the book, so I know it intimately, and I'm always trying to make it seem like it could just be no other way. And not, you know, brash or loud, though sometimes that is the right thing. We have dabbled there. but um, <laughs> Loud is great. Loud can when be a lot works. of fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But most of the time, your job is to be out of the way and, and, yeah. uh, and to yeah. simply Invisible. make it seem like this has always been and could be no other way. You know, that rightness is that you're sensing is, is that a, a career of pursuing that kind of sensibility. Okay. So book design, one definition is the art of incorporating the content, style, format, design, and sequence of the various components and elements of a book into a coherent unit i mean that sounds good but i'd hate to eat food made by someone making food that way wouldn't you i mean i like that that leaves out love doesn't it, it leaves out it leaves out curiosity it leaves out impishness <laughs> it leaves right out, it leaves out what it does i a nod to is that kind of again paying attention that, that intimacy with the material and a sense of how to weave things together um so that they they don't fight you and you know so many of our books now fight us on the most basic level. You grab a paperback and you open it and it, it fights you to open it because the publisher didn't ask the printer or the printer didn't care, you know, to get the grain of the paper the right way. Yeah, It's a very fundamental basic thing, but it's like, you know, using sugar instead of baking soda in a recipe. Like it just, it's, it'll screw it up if you don't do it right. Well, the second sentence in this uh, this little phrase here is that book design relies upon methods and rules which have been developed over centuries. Yeah. Uh, so I am very rooted in sort of a classic book design approach, mm -hmm. which isn't to say that all my books are sort of stodgy state and look like Oxford University Press in the 20s or something. But it means that I've steeped myself in this long tradition of making a page look right and flow right and behave right and do the job it's supposed to do. So what's right? And well, you know, uh, it's like asking how deep is a hole? I mean, you know, like, uh, depends what you're digging for, you know, yes, what you're doing, yes, you know, yes. um, what's right is what's right for that particular you content. To, that's is that right. it? Well, so there's, you know, some general things about, uh, the materials, like you, you can use better and worse materials. You want paper that, you know, isn't too stiff and, and takes ink well and yeah. preferably has a little roughness to it so that it diffuses the light that bounces back at your eyes. And, and, and you want an ink that's black, but not glossy, you know? And so that, like there's right in that sense, on yeah. the technical side of some things, but as far as the layout of a book in terms of its uh, size and uh, the type that you choose, and I mean, you, you're, that's going to shift from thing to thing to some extent as you are trying to evoke an atmosphere or, uh, make easy something that the author has made complicated in a, say, more technical book, mm -hmm. um, which has much apparatus or something, and you're, you're trying to make it navigable, make it, make it, you know, a uh, friction-free experience. You know, Understandable. Find, you know, so that when you think, I wish I knew what, oh, wait, there it is. They thought of that already. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so those are what's right, you know, is, is serving the reader is what's right. And, um, mm -hmm. and so for me, those things are, are coming out of, 
largely 18th and 19th century, not earlier too, I suppose, influences and coming out of the letterpress world. I, mean, I, I simultaneously learned to design books in the digital realm and in the letterpress realm. And so those, I, I don't see, I don't have a, a big, there's not a hard curb there for yeah. me, you know? <laughs> uh, so, and they both have, one has influenced, one tool has influenced the other. But I'll, because I'm like involved physically in the making of books, I have an advantage over uh, so many graphic designers, you know, who really don't have a handle on what yeah. thing is going to, so yeah. they, they spend a long time often making mistakes and hopefully correcting, but maybe not, you know, where they, they send something off to the printer, comes back and it wasn't quite satisfactory mm -hmm. and they don't really know why, because yeah. they, they weren't involved in the physical making of it. Yeah. That, that can be a real, a real detriment to learning if you're not, uh, it's, it's not insurmountable. You can jump and come around it. You know, you can go ask the questions, right? How do you decide whether the book is going to be a hardcover or a soft paperback? Well, for us, that's pretty straightforward. We don't do a lot of hard covers, um, but mostly when we're doing trade case binding, uh, the few instances that we have, we'll send them out somewhere else. And we don't like sending things out, so I mostly avoid it. So most of our, our trade books are, are paperback, sold paperbacks. For my well, how do you make limited decision? edition. Well, that's the equipment I own. Decision made. That's easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, and I control that process. Right. And it's a, right. and it keeps the no, price. No, you could buy something. And yeah. the price point is economical. Well, we we looked at, you know, we dabbled with making short runs of, of hardcovers yeah. for a while in the uh, early 2000s. And uh, we were making a basic square back case in-house. And they were all done by hand. And we found that there wasn't really a serious market for it. There were some people that really liked, liked having them. But the, the demand wasn't really there. And the cost uh, and labor was really high for what we could then ask for the in return. Yeah. And we brought them out simultaneously generally with the paperbacks. And I, I just didn't like having two editions of things, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, but so it was, a, it was an interesting experiment. I'm glad we tried it. But the next leap would be to, you know, expand the building, put in a case line. And again, I don't think that there's a demand, enough of a demand for hardcover books for the kinds of books we're doing, books, of poetry and so on. So we've not pursued that. That this we make really really nice sewn paperbacks with a jacket, you know, which which uh, yeah we price you know partway between a cheap paperback and uh, and a hardcover. But I am making hardcovers for limited edition books, and I'm doing it in house myself uh, because the scale is right. I mean, most of those runs are less than a hundred, more you know twenty to hundred is the range, and I can reasonably do that level of binding and get the binding I want in the way that I want. Um, and at a cost I can afford because I can spread the work out. And, uh, so in that case, because there are, uh, we're charging more for those books. Yeah. You can. We're starting to yeah. do slip cases and so on. So mm -hmm. those are letterpress printed books too. They're not, yeah. they're not offset printed books. And this is so because it, it of your sense. equipment from Galushka primarily. Uh, with the a... binding? No, not so much. No, That's just no. something I finally gotten around to. And you love doing it? I do actually. Yeah. I really like More it. than... As much as okay. I, it's it's an integrated process, so right. I I get grumpy if I do too much of one for too long. So <laughs> I tend to have about three or four letterpress projects in the go. So I'm I'm editing one and I'm typesetting or casting you know another, and then I'm printing another, and then I'm I have another one at the binding stage. Mm -hmm. And so that way you can kind of if you get frustrated you just walk to the next table. Yeah. Yeah. And and on top of that is of course the 12 trade books that we're doing every, every year. So it's it's a really it's it's a recipe for um to ward off boredom and uh the malaise of middle age, I guess. I don't know. I, mean, I just always have a lot on the go. Well, the soft cover books that you do uh publish because they're sewn and because they have jackets they do assume this lovely special desirability mm. it's it's uh it's as if you're you're trying to get the best of both worlds here absolutely yeah, yeah. and they're robust i mean they, in terms of how they stand mm -hmm. up yeah and you know there are more robust books than i would say I shouldn't put a number out, I guess, but like there is a large number of, of trade hardcovers now that are simply perfect bound in yeah, a cheap case. Yeah. 
Uh, my books are more robust than that. Mm-hmm. So whether it has a, a hard case on it or not, it's still a stronger book. Yeah, and going to last yeah. hundreds of years. Okay, moving along to the dust jacket. The spine is very important. Well, a book needs one. <laughs> well, <laughs> what, what it, way do you mean? It, like, what I mean is it assumes more importance because of the way that oh, it's presented sure. in a bookstore. Yep, yep. And so that's how true do you deal true. with the spine? Mostly by ignoring that truth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I have actually had a lot of fun over the years. Um, you know, one of the advantages of, of working for myself, you know, Gary and I with our own little enterprise, and, mm-hmm. uh, is that I, there's no uh, committee to deal, answer to. Right. Um, if I can convince the author it's a good idea, we're fine. And I, so a lot of the design awards we won back before I retired from design awards, you know, we won them, I think, in part because I was unfettered. Like I just was able to play and to try things. And so I very often will do things on spines that work against this truth and uh, will not display necessarily, well, mm-hmm. the front as well, the whole of anything that you kind of have to pick up and handle the book maybe to see exactly what you're looking at because it, it bleeds over the edge of a spine or it bleeds off the edge of a cover. But often it is the thing that will attract someone's or should attract their attention to the point that they will pull it out and look at the rest. Right. Yeah, no, it's not It's not completely an innocent. Uh, it is a flirtation for sure. Yeah. But you don't have to have necessarily the author, the title, the publisher, and the uh, and the and your logo. Even though you do put your G on pretty well all of them. No, right? I haven't used that G in in a long, long time. We I I kind of we had a logo early on, and I kind of was very resistant to having a logo. Mm-hmm. So I we we'll just put the name. We'll spell the name of the press out on the spine often, or sometimes okay. we'll we'll stack up the letters of Gasparo three over three. You know, yeah. but. Um, I, again, I kind of follow each project and see what opportunities are present itself. If it's a really skinny spine, as a lot of our poetry books will be, there's not a lot of real estate to do much there other than run the text. And um, if you have a bigger spine, you can, you know, design is so much about opportunism, right? Mm-hmm. That you, you are, Because you're paying attention, you recognize opportunities with the materials that will uh, allow them to be presented in a playful way or in a uh, you know, in a, a unique way, and it's staying alert to that and not just following the same old standard yeah. format. Treating it like an individual. Yeah, being present with it. You know, not phoning it in. Yeah, it's just that. This it's, makes... it's curiosity, Nigel. It's all about curiosity. <laughs> you know? Right. If you're not having fun, then uh, there's these two are things. <laughs> there's curiosity and there's enthusiasm. Sure, curiosity is just like pointed enthusiasm, is it not? <laughs> No, yeah, I guess it keeps <laughs> you are. thinking. It does keep you thinking. Curiosity goes better with enthusiasm. Yes, exactly. Because then it beces a sort of, it becomes mirthful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, which is exactly what you want in a good book. I think so. Yeah, it's some good laughs. Yeah, unless its job is to remind you of some great tragedy, which right. also is a legitimate literary form. But, but even there, you want to be uh, encounter a freshness and a strangeness, right? You want some enthusiasm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this, this question might fall flat, but what <laughs> rules do you follow when designing the cover? I know there are no rules. It's you follow the individual book, but... There must be something that you do to make your covers look so good. Oh, I mean, the main rule is is the boring one, which is honor the text. You know, like right. it's not about me. Like it's not about a place for me to show off. It, you know, an idea that the author doesn't like is not a good idea. Like no matter how good an idea actually is, it's not a good idea. So what, what do you mean? You have to. Well, if I can to, you have to get the approval of the author on your cover. Contractually, you I don't. Ahead. But uh, ethically, I do. Because what what good is having a book out there that an author is unhappy with? Okay, give me an example of a book that you read and then you came up with a great idea for a cover for it and that you're, that you're really happy with. Sure. And how that worked. We just did a book with uh, a poet named Sean Howard um, in Cape Breton. 
I'm blanking on the name, but anyway, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's, it has to do with the, uh, you're not a very good salesman. <laughs> no, no. I, you know, this is the problem with working. You know, you're always working with the 40 books you just published right. and the, the, the 10 you're working on and the tw and the 10 next to come. Yeah. It, like I, I, I've just, I've gotten really good at taking notes yeah. because I, it's too much. And, uh, and then, and then the letterpress stuff and then the world all around you. So uh, yeah, it's too much, but, you're um, paying too much attention. Uh, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, anyway, it's it's a series of poems about uh, 9 11, about the, okay. the about the the tragedy of that event. The poems were written but not published at the time, the year of the event. And then there's a section that follows, that was more recent, looking back on the event. Mm -hmm. And so, Sean's poems in this book are they're very short. They're they're lines, um, two three words, four words maybe maximum. So they're these long, skinny poems. And uh, as I'm starting to read the book and I'm thinking about it and thinking about the title and his name, um, the title is something like Unrecovered. And um, it occurs to me that I will set, I, I will make it a skinnier book than normal and that I will set on the, on the, on the jacket, the two towers. Yeah. In the in the name of the title and the name of the author, and that the top. I mean, they'll be the, the name. They're will running, be running side. Down, they're running. That's right. They, they've down the tower. Forty-five or, or ninety degrees. Yeah. And they're running down okay. as it like the two towers. Yeah. And that the t the tail end of the name and the title, which would be at the top of the of the book, will start to come apart. That wow. they'll 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 come out of linea out of their lineation. They'll start going sideways and left and right. They're coming down. And so, in doing that, evoke. The tower is being struck by the planes. That concept... It's literal. It's more than, than usual. Like, the, this was a particular opportunity, and this is why I talked earlier about the opportunism of design. Yeah. That to see that that, you know, and the title was the right... It wasn't like an eight-word title. You know, his name, Sean Howard, was just... You know, it matched. Like, it, it, it's an idea you'd have to abandon if the facts of the book did not line up. Like yeah. the facts of the the object of the book, but because these things lined up, and I'm, as I'm editing and I'm thinking these things, this comes to me. You know, I, I close that window, I open another window, and I start to dummy this as I'm editing the book, and it works. You got a call, and that's what I did. Yeah, I'll show you. Yeah. I'll show you when we're done. Yeah, uh -huh. and there it is. So sometimes it works that way, yeah. and other times you're really it's quieter, it's less high concept, it's it's more that you're simply finding the right scale at which to present the title and, and the author's name with a color of paper, you know, with a color of ink that feels right in its place. Yeah. And and that's a, a you know, a, a more common for like Faber was always that, that sort of, you know, that, that text driven. It's, it's, there's not a lot of pyrotechnics. Um, it's, it's not high concept. It's just clean. And so a lot of our design goes that way as well. But I'm alert to, you know, looking for other opportunities when it suits what the book is trying to do. Okay. Anything else on covers or flaps or spines or whatever? There, well, I think the, I think the most disappointing thing about jackets and covers is usually the text. You know, it, you look out there in the, in the big world about uh, publishing. Yeah. And so usually, you know, the writing of blurbs has been handed off. Either the author has contributed to something and they've tweaked it or they've handed it off to an intern, you know, to try and find something to say. And it, and they're usually nonsense. I mean, they just, they, they don't, you know. Or like, bullshit from another author or whatever. Sure, sure. And, and often very loving and careful and well-intended yes. bullshit, you know. But nonetheless, like, um, I love Don Mackay to death, but I, I never read Don Mackay's blurbs on the back of anybody's poetry book because he's written hundreds of them for everybody. And it, it, it's just that it's, it's devalued. It's devalued it in a way. And he, again, means the best was trying yes. to going it's, to bat for it's young friendship writers. right yes. right it's it, there's love in it and but it's difficult to do honestly and well in a way that actually helps the the reader so i put a lot of time into our blurbs are terse like I, there's never a i shouldn't say never there's almost never a, a, something from another author or the new york times or whatever there's none of that kind of stuff on the back there's probably three or four very terse sentences that I have written with the <laughs> sweating blood, you know, to try and find what do I need to tell you? 
about yeah. this book. Yeah. I'd like it to be as direct as possible, but also somehow as lyrical as possible, so as to and enticing, not and not to, to to reduce the book to something too simplistic. And knowing, like, just the the terror of like, and then I have to sell it to the author, yeah. and they're going to be like, "Why have you t you you took three weeks and you wrote this?" You know, so that's not how they're I see your writing. Book. That's not how I see the book. <laughs> yes. That's right. So it, it's a really it's it. I have to say, if there's one part of the job that I could. I could guarantee would still be done well and right, but I could make go away and like with a snap of my finger, that's it, right there. That and deadlines. Yeah. When I retire, I I Are you mean to retire. That's well, weird. I'm going to tell you what retirement looks like to me. Okay, doing all of this still. But even even less of a fuck about deadlines. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Retire from me. Right. <laughs> uh, or what? Less of a fuck about making money. Is well, that I already it? don't care about that. No, you I mean, already so, don't care about that. I already that don't you're care saying? about that. No, like well, we, as long as you can survive. Right. right. So we've always had a subsistence viewpoint. Yeah. About. Okay. You know, like, and you know what? It, through leaner times and better times, there's always been food on the table. When mm -hmm. I go home, and we've yeah. always managed. And you know, my children are probably, I have to consider them patrons of this enterprise because, you know, they were things that they didn't get to do. And, and their lives were different because of the, the choices that their mother and I made about, about what our lives are going to be. And I'm yeah. grateful to them for their, that, that, that's not something they've held against me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it certainly has shaped the people they've become. Yeah. And, um, but, you know, I, I really would rather, make books I care about at this at the scale where I still get to control things than to sort of be pursuing this abstract idea of growth. Yeah. Of, of getting yeah. bigger, of like, yeah, which you know, is, selling this, to this something, kind of building, multi -need, multi -need. building an asset to sell to someone else. Yes. I mean, yes. I, I, you know, I was, unless, you know, your, your model is the family farm where yeah. your goal is to leave the land in better shape than you showed when, when you showed up yeah. and to hand it on hopefully to someone after you. And to do good work in the meantime that nurtures you and feeds your family, but also somewhat feeds your community. And so if that is your goal, then, man, I am a tycoon. Well, it looks like you're thriving right now. You look pretty healthy and happy. I am. I mean, you know, it's there's always too much work to do. And I would say that the hardest part of this job in many ways is the responsibility of, that I, I feel to too many people. There's too many people who... Whether I get something done on time or not, or how well I do something, like some outcome for them depends upon like how their career goes, hangs on my, right. you know, and, and publishing like so many things, there's no coasting. Like you, you're only as good as the design, the, this design and this book. Yes like it's no. got to work every time. <laughs> yes, but you've also got a, a, a wonderful um, backlist. Oh, and that's a not good going basis. Any, that's not Absolutely. going anywhere. No, and, and we've certainly, it's something we kind of had a hunch about early on, but it, it's proven to be true. I mean, the, you know, that every year, so many copies of Execution Poems and Wyla Falls mm -hmm. and, and Jan Zwick, some of Jan Zwicky's work or Robert Bringer's work or Del Mackay's work or John Terpsch's work, you know, that, that uh, as you, you build this sort of stable of, yeah. of authors, it's not like big money, but it's it's a... It's a starting point, you know, you're ahead of the starting line already just because those books are in print and you're able to continue to put them out to that, that market that wants them. Well, yes, that, but also the uh, speaking f from a collector's perspective, you know, we will look everywhere for older books and we'll find all sorts of work that you've done over the last... 25 years. Mm -hmm. I suppose a lot of them may be trashed, but uh, there are a lot of them that are still in circulation. Yeah, there's enough. It's. I think we kind of hit a sweet spot for collectors in a way because there's enough of them out there that it's possible to find them, but yeah. not so many that they're everywhere. No. So there is still some search and some chase to it. By the way, I was in Victoria recently at Russell Books. Yeah. They got a little tiny little section, Gasparo books section. That's always heartening when you hear that <laughs> that uh, you know both with new and antiquarian booksellers that they 
that they that they bothered to sort of gather yeah. the books together and yeah. because there's a, clearly that's how people are looking for them. Yeah. And from the beginning that's been a part of what we've tried to do in terms of branding the press. Yeah. And I think we've been successful relative to, you know, the majority of small presses that people actually do go look for, do you have any Gasparo books? Yeah. And, well, uh, Coach House has the same appeal. Absolutely. No question yeah. of that. Absolutely. From the, from the 60s and 70s. But the, that's not how, so way. if you can make something that isn't immediately interchangeable with somebody else's thing, yes. um, that helps a lot in terms of... Uh, Particularly if you want to work at this scale, if you're chasing volume, you can be as anonymous as you as need be yeah. because it's all about just moving product. If you're dependent on making a really good product and making it slowly and making it carefully, and, mm. and uh, you know, then you really do need to cultivate and making it uniquely yours. Right, and, and so that uh, without it being stale, that there's always a kind of thread of like you know, you yeah. see them, yeah, and you're like, oh, and it, in the same way that I see. Um, you know, early Counterpoint books or, or North Point or, or I see uh, Oberon or I see Favor or I see, you know, and you know, you know what you're you looking do. at and you're yeah. delighted and you pick it up and you'd see what, what, whether it's something you're interested in acquiring. Yeah. Okay. What about end papers? What's your feeling about end papers? Blank, blank or... Again, it depends on uh, each book. Or yeah, very much, yeah. So yeah. like with our trade books, we tend to do uh, a, a tipped on end sheet, which is not a proper end paper, but we'll, uh, I like to do black paper cover that we bind the books into. So I'll put a black end sheet so that when you open the book, you get that full effect of two black. Right. And uh, uh, it's a pain, it's slow, it, it's a lost leader in a way. I mean, yes. But, I, but it's important to me that yeah. it's there. Um, on... Hardcover books, it's a mix. Like I, a printer I very much admire is Gray Zeitz at Larkspur Press in Kentucky. He's a very dear friend, and as uh, you've done a bibliography, we did a bibliography, yeah. absolutely, of his work. I just he's a guy that took letterpress tools and but behaved like a trade like a small trade publisher, and has published his neighbors. You know, whether it was Wendell Berry or Guy Davenport or you know. Uh, or all those Kentuckians you've never heard of, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. but um, and he's done it. He's used uh, handset type and letter presses and does editions, open editions of the five hundred plus, you know. And so when he makes hardcover books, he simply pastes the you know the front leaf of the book down. You know, yeah, it's it's, it's not fancy. It's mm-hmm. uh, it's just and it, you know he'll put some extra blanks at the end of an extra sewn signature blank so that it, you could cut it out and rebind it if you wanted. But it's a very basic approach, not fancy at all. And so some letterpress work I've done with end papers, that's what I've done because it just seems to suit the no nonsense of the project. And other times, I mean, I'm working on a book right now, which is a wood type edition of Hopkins Pied Beauty, which I, it occurred to me that would look good in three inch tie, uh, high uh, wood type. Um, it, would, it would work with the sprung rhythm across page spreads and um, it's also a way to turn a sonnet into 48 pages but, <laughs> anyway, but I've had and papered mar- and papers marbled for that book because most of the book the inside is this a very austere plain gothic wood type you know this it, it's it's not nothing about it is fancy you know it's just it's it's an advertising tool you know war <laughs> a pantyhose on sale you know like it, that's what that type was for and here it is expressing pie beauty by hopkins and uh, and i plan a, a pretty basic binding for it as far as it's just going to be a, cloth, a plain cloth covering uh, but i wanted a, a moment of like aha you know yeah. so that has a marble end piper by this wonderful uh, marble named uh, Gemma Lewis in England. Mm. who's was kind enough to make, make a special run for me. So, so yeah. So sometimes... Another reason to get that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What about the, the double page spread then? How do you approach it? Well, no, first of all, I should go to the first page of the book. Mm. Any thoughts on that? Like, Typically, there's an initial. Do you use initials or not? We don't use initials, no. no. I mean, it's kind of, it's, in this day and age, in the kind of production we're doing, it's not as important. Okay. Um, you well, mean what like, about like, then the classic layer? Oh, you mean as a drop capital kind of initial? Yes. Oh, I thought you meant like signature initials at the bottom. Oh, no, I no. I mean, I mean the first letter. Typically. Uh, it's 
We don't often use a drop capital. Again, it depends on the pro project. Sometimes we have just to be impish or, or uh, because it, uh, the book is a, has a highly classical design where that makes sense. But I, I, I'm more influenced perhaps by early 20th century designers like Chickald and Updike and Rogers. So they did they did like those sort of fanciful yeah. things to some extent. But, mm. uh, but I, I, I'm much more of a modernist, even though I have... You know, very people would look at her and go, well, he's a modernist. <laughs> yeah, but, you don't look like one relative to yeah, what else is going yeah. on, but still. And right. I was in a, I had work in a show in, uh, uh, well, they were celebrating Rubens in the, the Baroque in uh, Antwerp at the uh, Platinum Moritis Museum. And I was actually the only North American uh, trade publisher included in the show on the influence of the Baroque, which I thought really interesting because I don't think of my work as being particularly no, Baroque. No. When was this? Oh, a couple of years ago. Okay. Yeah. I was a great thing to be asked yes um, yeah you know how it is you're often ignored by your own community yeah, yeah. people far away <laughs> say who is this who yes, is this person right. so a scholar knew uh, over there who was on this committee knew about our work and advocated for like this is a good example of someone using these classic uh, these baroque traditions and and reviving them in the present in a way that isn't just aping them but is actually yeah. integrating this, this thinking deeply into the the planning of the book and carrying it out making it current yeah yeah that's right repurposing an old tool yeah so the answer is don't often use not often. Caps. yeah but but sometimes what about the, the, then the, the classic double page layout any thoughts on that that uh, it's the bedrock direct you yeah it's the bedrock and and so getting those margins right and what's right well right is that your uh thumbage Thumbage is nice when you can afford it. It depends often on the project and, and the budget and uh, whether the author's writing with really long lines. Like if it's a poet, like you're somewhat, yeah, the, the length of the line is, is, is part of it. How small can you make the type? How long yeah. is the line, you know? And, and you often get into those debates about, you know, I've, I've contemplated this line a long time and I can't see why it's longer. Could you explain it to me? Mm. And and uh, if you can, if you want to defend it, I will like walk on coals to make this work for you. But if this is just like an indulgence, then we need to talk. Like this line is messing up the book. Yes. So so I'm not afraid to have those conversations. <laughs> um, but yeah. but as far as that the the spread, you a lot of the principles are just really very basic. You want the that upper margin to be smaller than the lower one, and the outside margins to be bigger than the inner one. And after that, it gets into just sort of tuning. And uh, I mean, I, I, classically, you wanted the, the addition of the two inner margins to equal one of the outer ones. But, you know, that's not often practical. And our, our paper-bound book doesn't open quite as wide as a, a hardcover book either. So you have to keep that in mind. But, you know, that's the first thing I establish. You know, there's a couple of sizes of books I like to use here. Five by eight, I really love. 5.3 by eight and a half, I really love. Um, and I'll go off those if I need to be, but those ones feel right in hand more often. So you'd find probably 90% of our books have those proportions, uh, the, the trade books. Yeah. And so you're starting with, is it going to be a really long book? Because if so, it should be the bigger size. If it's going to be a really short book, then it, it could be either. Am I going to have to set the, you know, there's special challenges with the, with the text, like are there, you know, notes or footnotes, marginal notes, you know, what you're thinking about all of these things. And then you're starting to work out that spread and you're, you're just stepping into a, an average set of pages, a couple, you know, in the first chapter, you're ignoring the beginning and you're just starting to play with the margins and think about what's going to look right. And, uh, yeah. And no, part of that is experience, obviously. Experience, but, but, but then the, every time it's a new, canon. Well, knowing the canon, absolutely. And, and so, you know, what I find interesting is I will forgive other people what I would never forgive myself. So I look at something like, oh, this is working. I'm failing. And then I'll go look at a, a book by Baskerville or, uh, you know, uh, an, uh, an older printer, even from the 20th century, you know, and a non such book, whatever. And, and they'll do things and I'll, when I actually measure it and look and go, oh, well, they didn't, they also didn't get this exactly perfect, but it doesn't bother me. It's fine because... I'm not feeling the, the, the weight of it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The, the pressure. Right. Yeah. So, so uh, you don't trust your, you're more critical of yourself or you should be, I suppose. Um, those who aren't are making shitty books. Well, it's like intelligent people doubt themselves. Stupid people 
I think they know everything. <laughs> Run for president? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, or, or prime minister. Sure, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it, 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 this comes back to what I said earlier about you're only as good as what you're doing right now. Like, you, you know, you have to make it work in the present. Uh, you can't just take the thing that worked last time. And it's surprising how true this is. You can set a book in 12-point memo on a 15-point letting and uh, in one text, and you can take and set up the same way with the same margins, the same line length, and it looks wrong. It's a different text. Some it's you know, and it's it's not interesting, and it's not just in your brain. It's it's you know, some the second person. It's the you, words themselves. Somebody's using more capital letters because there's more proper nouns. Right. Like this has a difference in in terms of how a text sets on a page. Or someone, you know, <laughs> likes a lot of, by coincidence, it's a lot of P's or something. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Whatever it is, you know, there's there's things going on. Or the paragraphs are shorter or they're longer. I mean, all of these things have an impact. So you really, you have to learn principles. You can't learn a recipe. Mm-hmm. You have to know what coriander does. Yeah. But you never know how much coriander is put in exactly. <laughs> you have to you have to try. Okay, so what's the, the big general not recipe, but uh, thought that the, the cook has to have before starting anything. Well, I suppose like a cook is looking for flavor ultimately and, and texture. The designer is looking kind of for the same thing, right? Like that you, you want... Uh, it is about experiment. You want to be able to like the eye to be easy in the text as it, as yeah. it reads. And that's why sometimes you have to walk away and come back and just pretend that you are not, you were not there before and like you're reading it new. And as you look at a page and decide whether it's it's reading right, yeah. whether that font, whether that size, good. whether it's pop right, whether it's popping, you know, out at you, or it's too gappy, or or there's too much white, or, or it's too tight, or mm. like all of these things, you're basically a, a page is a kind of tapestry. It's a texture that you're creating as well as um, needing the reader to relax into it and forget about it. Yeah, and yes. just just be present in it. It's an interesting contradiction, yeah. isn't it? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Just uh, we're just winding down here. We'll. I want to just quickly look at the front matter. Any thoughts on the half title? It's good to have one. <laughs> <laughs> I like lower. I like. I like small caps. Okay. Not always, but often. Yeah. often. yeah. Frontispiece. Again, it's it's sort of book de- dependent on on the on the text. It's I like a good. Do you have portraits of. But of uh, authors, we've never done that. No. and okay. I think it was was Signal doing that for a while. Signal Press. Uh, I, I know. Yes, they I were. Think they, they were lovely. They were full bleed photos. It's a wonderful place to do an author photo for, say, a uh, poetry book. But having watched Simon already do that, Simon Dardick, I, the Dardick, yeah. Dardick, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's. Uh, I I didn't copy it. <laughs> okay. Right, so the title page itself. What about that? Title page, I kind of do last. Okay. Usually, even after, I, I maybe have started it before I do a cover or a jacket, but I inevitably go back to it after I've done a cover or a jacket, and and basically align it with it and, and, and make sure that it is in sympathy or in contrast or whatever I need it to be, mm-hmm. but that it mm-hmm. is in conversation with it. I almost always put color on that page. Almost always, it's the it's the best hundred bucks I can spend yeah. in the design of a book it's because just, it tricks the it's reader. It's so striking. It tricks the reader all the way through the rest of that book. You sort of, that color is in your brain. Yeah. And you feel like you're in a book where somebody, and that's not that we haven't invested and paid attention to the other things, but, no. but when you see that color there, it says, oh, not off a photocopier, yeah. not off a docutech or espresso machine. Something special is what it says to right. me. And, it, yeah. and, the, and the cost to me is, uh, you know, probably less. But if I think I'd, if you asked for it, I'd charge you a hundred bucks to add that color, probably right. on a run. It's a piece of fi- uh, film and a plate and a and the press time and a cleanup. It's money well spent. Okay. The dedication page. I really like dedication pages, partly because I don't like books that rush to the beginning. And so all of these things, you know, the the half title or bastard title, the. Uh, the, the title page of Friday's Piece, they all kind of like ease you in. And one of the reasons we years ago removed all the copyright information from the front and tucked it at the back yeah. as like a colophon page. It drives some people nuts. 
And, you know, I've never been complained at by the Library of Canada or anybody like that. that, that nobody seems to care. Um, I always thought that the colophon was at the back anyway. The colophon... Maybe that's mostly uh, fine press books, but... Well, the colophon at the back generally was not the copyright notice, but just a, a notice about who printed the book and... and, and what, it, what, what it was what, printed on right. and what the typeface was. So we basically put put the... You know, the, the, the CIP data yeah. and the you know, ISBN and the, you know, right. please don't steal our shit stuff at the back. And because it always seemed weird to me to be entering something like a book through the broom closet. Yeah. You know, because yeah, yeah. that is wholly technical broom closet stuff material. that we don't really need to look at. Well, we, we need, but we don't need it in that moment of. No, you know, we're not introducing the book is, no, it's like it's coming into church yeah, right like yeah. you know you're coming through the front doors and <laughs> you, you know right. you take in the atmosphere and right. so all of these things like that 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 dedication and you know it's I, like seeing a bunch of brooms and stuff in front of the in front of the church yeah the church may be yeah. clean but... walking past the smoking custodian you know or whatever <laughs> right. like it it, it it's just not, you know, like you don't enter a kitchen or a restaurant through the kitchen, and right. particularly not through exactly. the, past the compost bins yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah. So it's the same kind of thing. I think that okay. it helps to bring, like that color in the title page, all of that stuff yep. is to sort Clean of it up. enter, it prepare, prepare you to enter this, this thing. Okay. Table of contents. My one rule about table of contents is no, no leader dots. Okay. <laughs> you know, the little dot, 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 dot. Yeah, you know, yeah. They're, they're, yeah. They're such a big thing. Like you don't like that? Oh, it's just, they're ugly and unnecessary. Okay. And they, they just, they mar our page. Like, it's just any, it's it's an instant indication of amateurism, in my mind. Well, anytime I see that's that. That's harsh. Uh, I'm good with it. Uh, there's just so many other ways to present. You're presenting, you know, a map, essentially, and, and uh, with finding aids. Yeah. And there's so many ways to do that that are just less ugly. Okay. And, uh I, I really I sometimes enjoy setting, and I, I do it all. I don't use any of the special tools. I do them. I build them from scratch. Um, and, and again, late in the job so that everything's, you know, the chapters are actually, if you've edited a chapter title, it's going to be right in both yes, places. Yes, that's you know? right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I take as much joy out of designing uh, you know, that page or a good index as I do um, from the actual title page, say. So. Forgot the epigraph. Any thoughts on that? Epigraphs are overused. I like them at the beginning of books. Actually, they, they make sense to me there. Mm -hmm. Where I where I take issue often is poets who have epigraphs in every second poem is to start the poem. And my absolutely brutal line that I almost never use is, "Why do you want someone else to have written the best line yeah. in this poem?" Yeah, or the book. Why Why do you want some the, the reader to remember someone else? You know, in the best instances, an epi good epigraph. Um, sets the table, uh, you know, makes a link forward or backwards, you know. Uh, and that, yeah, unless, they, unless they, they can a, be very useful, but 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 in moderation. You, but, well, useful in the sense that if this book was instigated by a relationship with right, that, right? Uh, otherwise, or if they're hinting at a a more lyrical or abstract element that is not necessarily immediately. Evident. evident in the text yeah. that can be a very useful device yeah. but when you start plunking at the top of every poem or every chapter or section or whatever it becomes this kind of shortcut as opposed it's a, it's a, it becomes hallmark cardy it's a way out of doing the work just do the work don't don't start with their image to get me in a good mood just do the work yes and no i mean one of my favorite canadian books of poetry of all time is michael lister's bloom mm -hmm. and he does a lot of that he does probably too much uh, I, I disagree <laughs> i'm okay with my assertion no no you, but but all all assertions are with it, all assertions yeah. are limited in their in their application so yeah. so recognizing a, a a shortcoming or a potential weakness in the epigraph is different than a prohibition right mm -hmm. it just it sort of like amps up your sense of responsibility to not screw it up because you're aware that it is entirely possible to screw it up yeah. And and to have all of these sort of lame duck epigrams all over the place. Although funny, I mean, I always thought an epigraph was just at the front of the book. Or you're using well, it. Well, I guess I'm using it more. Yeah, because yeah. I'm because I'm using. So every poem is like a book in a sense, in terms of its sort of interior yeah. logic. And so and and so the fact yeah. that authors are starting with the title and then an, and then a quotation from someone else, they're essentially using it as a 
a junior scale epigraph, I suppose. Okay. So maybe there is an actual fancy ass word that is the right word for that that neither you or I in our in our years of activity in our erudition have not have not stumbled across. But do fill me in when you find it. <laughs> okay. Now quickly here, a forward, preface, acknowledgements, introduction. What thoughts do you have on those, if any? Um, again, it's so dependent on like a really uh, design wise, I'm talking. Oh, design wise. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Design wise. So once you get into things like that, you're dealing largely with, you know, how to deal with a title, uh, how to deal with an opening line, you know, uh, how, how much of a depth to leave, uh, whether you leave any depth. Like, you know, I find I, I, I rub my hands together with glee when I get a manuscript where I can legitimately do something strange um, without it being forced. So so what I mean by that is that uh, you get a book of poems and all the poems are of a uniform length. And they're all, you know, uh, the lines are pretty uniform. And you go, ah, I can bottom a line all of these poems, <laughs> you know, to yes. the bottom, which yes. is not, a, you know, none of them run over to a second page. So suddenly you are, mm. th there's a whole new box of tools that you mm. you need to say, does it make sense? Or am I just like having a piss here? Yeah, <laughs> like, you know? yeah. So, I was going to say farting around. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so you get to... Um, uh, sometimes you get to indulge uh, something different when you when when the text presents the opportunity yeah. and when it serves the text, but yeah. it has to do both. Yeah, I mean, it, looking at it, it it can't confuse you or like the, a as a reader, you you do question why the design is different than you might normally expect. That's going to come up. So you, as a designer, want to make sure that's a good, there's a good reason that's that right. you did that. Yeah. And we often, I usually, I sort of like, uh, you know, vent that tendency um, in more experimental things like chapbooks or letterpress pieces. Like, oh, yeah. And in a trade book, I mostly mind my own business and, and just keep to the main, you know, the main the classical approaches to things. But one of the things when it comes to beginnings of chapters and such, I really like, basically, you have to decide centered or not centered. And that has an in impact on everything throughout the rest of the book mm -hmm. and so you know if you have subheadings are they long are they more than one line you know you've got to look at those elements and then make decisions that impact what seem like aesthetic decisions actually come back to these um, what is possible with what has to happen here i really love the pilcro oh yes yeah, so the I paragraph marker yeah i love it yeah and so i almost so you know how you do things uh, well how I have done things for years and thought, yep, my this territory, like I'm trapping beaver and soon more people will be here trapping beaver and there won't be as much beaver for me anymore. But there's been a number of things in terms of design and production that I thought, yep, we'll have a few years and then other people will go, look how easy it is to do this right or do this better. And then they'll join me here on this side of the river and it'll just be, you know, it'd be nice to have There'll company. be no beaver. Yeah, yeah. But, but it'll just be not my own domain. But the Pilcro... I can't think anyone else using the Pilcro in any meaningful way. I mean, you know, Bringhurst uses it once in a while for some things, but but as a sort of pretty steady in most books device for marking the beginnings of sections, marking the beginnings of chapters, it's just not ha like nobody's using it. Well, that's good. That's good. But it, that I used it on my uh, one of my websites. Yeah. But that's yeah yeah yeah. That's, yeah, that's yeah. A, but but like again, I'm talking in, in broad terms. Not it's just generally not. Um, it's the thing I discovered and thought. Holy cow, how come no one is using this? Right, right. And then uh, as I went forward and keep looking over my shoulder, I'm walking down that path alone. <laughs> so, so you think about something practical, like when you've got a, a text that has a lot of short section breaks and you need a little gap, you know, but those gaps are awkward for getting good balanced pages. And they often appear at the bottom of a page and you're not necessarily sure that, it, you know, so often the sort of three asterisks would be used or that kind of yeah. thing. But they take up a lot of space. So instead of having, say, one blank line or two blank lines and then a new paragraph, you have to have a blank line and instead of asterisks, another blank line, that's three lines. So <clears throat> if you have a lot of these throughout a book and you say, we're going to do one blank line and a pilcro at the beginning of the next paragraph and maybe a couple of capitals or, or a word in, in small caption, and that that will signal enough. Suddenly you have a much less problematic thing when it comes to the breaking of pages. Mm -hmm. So it's not, again, it's somewhat aesthetic, but it's also about how to get efficiency in a complicated text. From the perspective 
of just doing a, the type set on page count yeah right of, yeah. I, I, that's economics right yes. so so yeah. it looks like a, oh andrew really likes the pilgrim but that actually <laughs> i like right. things not being you know two sections longer than they need to yes. be right yes so yeah. so it's a mix of these things. and again that points to you know this this knowledge design and production right right what about uh, roman numerals for for the pages at the front end of the book I, well in general, I use Roman numerals very little. I sometimes, for a while, I used them on title pages just because it was fun and obscure. Yeah. <laughs> but generally speaking, in terms of using them to number sections or poems, you know, within a text, I almost always try to push an author towards, you know, Arabic numerals because yeah. we're just not, it's just not part of our cultural moment Roman numerals. That's not what we do. Yeah, but there's nothing wrong with standing out and, and following None tradition. of it's impractical. Like, so if there's like one, two, and three, everyone can follow that. But if it gets up to 25 or 27 yeah. or 80... Or, but typically know. it's just in the introductory part so, of the book. So I got, I'll get to that in a second. Yeah. I, I mean more generally, like if someone's no. numbered like 80 poems oh, and they yeah. want these Roman numerals, no. I would say, what are you doing? Do you really want to be mis not you know misunderstood that badly? But when it comes so in the prelims using Roman... Yes. Um, I get, again see it as a largely antiquated practice that doesn't have a practical application anymore. Okay. Because often, you know, you would have the text and it would be ready and you would start and you'd start setting page one and you'd number those pages as you'd set them, right? Right. But Erasmus was still writing the foreword. Well, that's so the, the prelims would have their own their own set. system. Yeah, because you, you could add to it without screwing up the other pagination. Right, exactly. So it, it became this sort of, it had this function and you sometimes see it in re, you know, uh, reprinted books where a new apparatus has been added. In a situation like that, there's a logic to it that merits uh, considering it. Uh, there are perhaps other better solutions. But as a kind of like default habit of like, if there's a forward, you know, well, the page number should only start on, on the first page of the actual text. I mean, that's nonsense. If there's not apparatus, you, you know, because it's complicated, why would you complicate it? With our trade books, we start numbering on the very first sheet of the very first press sheet. Like, mm -hmm. so the first tech part of the not text. on page one of the text, but on like the, when I count numbers, I count them from, you know, when you take that first octavo press sheet and you fold it mm -hmm. and there's a blank sheet on the front, mm -hmm. that's page one. But you don't put one on it, do you? You don't. If it's, no, if it's, you put, if it, then you started at the at three or five or seven, so the, so, depending so on where the text maybe that's starts. right. The, the, the yeah. first page of the text or the yeah. introduction or whatever okay. might be page seven or yeah, something, seven. right? And that in that context, where that end sheet is never a waste sheet or bound, it's just like there, it makes sense. So we, from a trade production standpoint, have always done that, even though it's not old practice, right? Where it got me into trouble <laughs> for the first time is when I used my friend Gray Zeit's idea of like using that first sheet as your paste down. And so I, when I was doing his bibliography, I was like, the, the page numbers were all wonky. And I kept saying, well, just count like, count every page that went through the sheet, through yeah. the press. Like right. that's, that's just count them all, whether yeah. they're blank or the, at the beginning or the end or whatever. And he was having trouble with this and I couldn't figure out why. Well, that's why, because he was pasting what would be the literal page one and yeah. the literal page 80 down. Yes. So they were gone. <laughs> and now page three is page. Well, like, you know, so I did, I made a book that way and I thought, Oh God, of course. So now when I do a letterpress book, I always start the page numbering on the first page of the text. Yes, okay. But when I do a trade book, I go with the other one. So okay. just not, like three people are going to understand the explanation, <laughs> yes. but they're going to laugh. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Okay, what about where you put the number? Again, it's probably a function of the of the specific book itself. But do you tend to put the number, uh, you know, at the top right hand corner, or do you go right center at the bottom? Again, it's dependent on the broader design, whether yeah. you're centering or not centering, you know, okay. your headings and so on. But I have to say, of all of the things, oh, I can't remember who it was. There was a, a British designer who once in a letter to an American designer made in the twenties or thirties made fun of. Uh, the extent to which American book designers thought novelty, you know, design was simply moving the folio around to different locations. Yeah. <laughs> that that was all that they would change in design. Mm. And and from the moment I read that, I I felt it keenly. I mean that that's it's so true. It's it's um, I, I I hate 
folios. I, of all the things that give me the most angst in designing a book, I hate figuring out where to put the numbers, the page numbers, in a way that that doesn't say, "Hey, look at me," mm -hmm. or is a you know a problem. If you have any kind of a book with any kind of complexity, which are the fun ones to set, you have to find a place where it works in all of the of the iterations of the various parts of the book, um, or you have to make exceptions and move it. You know, and that's the other thing is, and that's something I definitely learned from Bringhurst from watching his design. You know, not something he wrote or said. Or I'm looking at a lot of his early books he designed. The thing that I learned was the the judicious exception. Mm -hmm. Places you would drop a folio just because it it made sense for some other quiet that quietly you could sneak an extra line in the page and make a uh, avoid an awkward break, but you had to lose the folio to do it, and you just lose the folio and you don't tell anybody about it. And so, sorry, what do you mean fo by that? Folio is a page number, right? Yeah, so, yeah. So if you so in other words, you just don't put the number on the page. You just make it disappear. For, for and, one page, it's gone. Right. So but, one person. But you know yeah, that that page is, say, is 146. Yes. And you know that the page following is 148. Like yes. there's not a problem. No, right. No. So, um, but, you know, or, you know, if you have it, if you're doing them on the in the margin and you have a suddenly have a long line that has to cheat and come out of the, the normal margin and the mar folio is in the way. Well, it disappears. Like, yeah. so. Robert learned early, and I and I learned early by watching him, that design is not about making a rule and then never bending yeah. that rule. It is about absolutely knowing where to quietly <laughs> make these exceptions. And that makes a very robust design. Because if you were trying to design something that will work for, you know, a, a particularly a complex book, a complex piece of prose with lots of apparatus and notes, and you're trying to design something that will work in every possible iteration, you know, to go, you'll go mad. You have to find the kind of medium, yeah. the, the thing that is the best thing, and then massage these exceptions and problems. And that's where I think, you yeah. know, you can spot the really, it's not the leaders on the table of contents so much. That was a, a, a cheap shot. But it's in these things, you know, the ability to be elastic in the design in a way that no one notices, yeah. but works. That's where you can tell the good designers who, who love their work mm -hmm. versus those who are just hammering it out. And the folio is often the culprit. <laughs> well, we start looking for that. <laughs> okay. And if you have a good proofreader, they always say, there is no page number on yeah. this page. And yeah. then you ignore them. <laughs> then, you should, then you say to them, listen, that's good book design. That's right. <laughs> so back of the book, the appendix or addendum, same same kind yeah, of yeah, comments. Yeah, same kind of comments. Yeah, yeah. Uh, glossary, bibliography. And the colophon. Yeah, I like colophons when I can do them. At the, I mean, at the very I, least, I, love I, reading I, them. I, I they're, make they're, sure there's they're, something. They're poetry. I yeah. always, in our trade books, I always make sure that, that at least the the typeface and uh, it is named, and and that Gary yeah. and I are named, and and as the the overseers of the work. But we don't tend to do too elaborate. And sometimes I'll do a more enough, you know, length colophon if I'm describing it the type, you know, or something, if. I've got room. So often these kinds of things, you're expanding and contracting you know, end material because you're like, ah, oh, if I take this out, I'll fit in nine signatures, not 10. And no one will miss it. And, but sometimes it's like you're three or four or five pages over and you've got you know, still more of the 16 pages to fill up. And so you balance whites in the front and the back as best you can. And you add, you break something out, you add a note in the type or you add, yeah. it's a way, to, it's a, it's a trick. It's an optical yeah. illusion to make the book look balanced. Mm. So you don't always do it. And I've, I've been in situations, I was in one recently where an author was quite insistent that, oh, he really, really wanted one of those wonderful notes in the type. And then like that book was like, jammed up against, it was a too long book. And it was jammed up against the end of a section. It's like, there's no way I'm going to add a note of the type. This book is too long. Yeah. So I had to find a diplomatic and quiet way to get around it. <laughs> okay, finally, speaking of diplomatic and quiet, we hear a lot about you. We don't hear that much about Gary. Maybe you could just tell me a bit about I, I know nothing about him. So. The company is us. Yeah, right. there would be no Gaspero without the two of us. And Gary is, you know, like, you know, Updike had his partner. What was his name? Bianchi or something? I can't remember. Who was it? The That's printer. The thing. Yeah. Yeah. Don't know. But right. Nobody remembers him. Right. But, you know, he ran the damn shop for the most part. He kept things going. And yeah. it was Updike who 
wrote things and did the design and the clients knew Updike. But it was his partner, John, who kept this train running. He runs the offset shop and the trade bindery. So when I'm done editing and designing a book, hands off to Gary and the way he runs with that. And I'm you know, still in, in the mix, but, but it's, it's, I've left it to him and I move on and do the, the jacket on the letterpress or whatever. Gary also you know, manages the, the sales and the finances and all that side of it, keeps our, all of our tech running. That's you know, a lot. Runs press yeah. when needed, runs, keeps the equipment running. You know, like, so there's a, there's a lot of overlap between some of the things we do and then other areas like I haven't. And you I, get along. Yes. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And, That's you know, key. we are different, very different people in some ways, and yet our values are well aligned. And there's been rough moments, you know, throughout the, you know, there was a period, for example, you know, where Gary, his marriage fell apart. It had implications for the press, inevitably. And that was a pretty rough, rough time for us as, as partners. But actually, the part of it that was rough was really pretty short. It was, you know, evident to me that I didn't want to do this unless I do it with Gary. Mm. And so we were going to figure it out. And we did. Yeah. Mm. It, so it's funny. It, he's not, he's not someone who, on a local level, he takes a lot of pride in owning the business. And you can, you can see it. And he, in terms of how he presents himself to other people, how he talks about the business, how he, uh, on the sort of bigger scale of like, you know, being interviewed or writing a piece on something, he's just less interested. The That's big, good that you're, again, you compliment each other. I, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And we've always worked in consensus. We've always managed through the, even the toughest things to talk and to listen and to come around to a decision that we both then got behind. Mm -hmm. And that has always been the case. And uh, I'm grateful for that because that's not how a lot of partnerships go. And, you know, the biggest difference, I think, between Gary and I is, is on that creative side, perhaps. And it's not that Gary has a lot of things that he doesn't hear that are creative in a broader sense. But I come to work every day and I'm like working on things that I originate, that I've selected the work uh, or I have created the work um, and I'm you know, carrying it out. And when it comes to the letterpress projects, even I'm just there's a I can't work fast enough to keep up with the things I want to do. When Gary comes to work in the morning, the nature of his part of the job is different in that he uh, is executing something that's requested. It's a print job with a client who wants mm -hmm. wants 500 of this. And he doesn't matter to him whether that's the right color for it. That's the color they want, you know? <laughs> so he, right? So he's, or and even with me, when I hand him a job, those things are determined already. Yeah. And he's, you know, not, he, he and I talk about what books we're going to do. When I'm signing books, he's, in, you know, he's he's not often read them in advance, but I'm we're talking about it. But there, there, so that's the, I think the biggest difference in, in, in terms of our involvement and, and really the only fundamental difference in terms of our involvement. So you both believe that paying attention is important. Yeah. And I, I don't know whether Gary, had he not bumped into me, whether he would have articulated these things in any kind of way similar. I don't know. I, it's hard to say. But I think that when... I articulate the ideas. He recognizes in it the values that he holds, right. and, and 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 sees those values voiced. And I know that because I've watched Gary and his other involvements in the community. You know, he's he's uh, involved in his in his church, and he's involved in the, at the food bank, and he's involved in, in various other you know volunteer organizations around around the community. And I watch him living those things out in the way he is, mm -hmm. the, the person that he is. And so it's not a hard sell for me to go to him and say, this is more important than that, because he's already there, mm -hmm. he, though he would not stand up on a soapbox like me and wave his arms and rant, you know, for, <laughs> for an hour. about this is better than that. Or, or we must do this and we shouldn't do that. Where I'm much more prone to uh, expressing those opinions and, and, and the hope that it helps. OK, finally, we shit on presidents and prime ministers and people yeah. who run for them. I'm, I've been feeling bad about that ever since we 
said that. <laughs> oh. It was a throwaway line, Nigel. <laughs> it, it was, but it kind of goes in the face of paying attention to the point of getting involved. And, I mean, we can pay attention, but if we don't do anything, yep. if we don't, we can talk, you know, we can have a conversation about yeah. things that are upsetting us and I can put it on a podcast, but it's not the same as actually getting involved, for example, in yeah. the election yeah. or running for office. Uh, I'm going on here a bit, but no, no, I'll yeah. edit this. <laughs> yeah, no, no, don't, no, don't. I, I, I just, right. what I want to say is the elite do run this world. And if democracy is worth anything, then people actually have to get involved. Absolutely. And vote for the right people that will actually, for example, redistribute income, t at least to the point where people aren't starving yeah. on the street in, in our society. I think that when a publisher is doing their job, that they are contributing to that community activity of participating in all of the elements of our community, including the political elements, mm -hmm. whether it's partisan or not. One of the involvements I've had in my community for the last couple of decade or so has been, um, I've been very involved with municipal politics. but. Not in a way that's visible. <laughs> My, I mean, I came into this largely out of a, a literary background and a journalism background. And so uh, some of my earliest gigs as a journalist were West Carlton Township right. town meetings before they were amalgamated into, <laughs> into the greater Ottawa, you know, as the, as the one reporter in the room while the five contractors who happened to be counselors around the table changed the rules to their benefit, you know. So... Uh, it's a way of thinking about the world and engaging the world journalism that is deeply rooted in me. I started my first newspaper in my teens. And so while I've ended up in this, what looks like an isolationist sort of corner of the literary endeavor, which mm. is uh, poetry, nothing could be further from the truth. I see the books that we make as providing sort of the nutrients needed to grow a healthy community. Um, to um, foster the kind of critical thinking, the kind of sense of responsibility that brings people out to vote thoughtfully, mm. that allows people mm. to question, you know, uh, development agreements, <laughs> you know, it, it, to untangle uh, land use bylaws, <laughs> you know, and mm. to think about what kind of communities they want to live in and how to take care of each other and not to get steamrolled over by simply moneyed interest all the time. Most people don't... Think about that stuff and say, oh, where you start is with poetry. <laughs> but in a lot of ways, it is where you start. And so the chair you're sitting in has very often been sat in by uh, people thinking about running for office, running for office, good, uh, good. people coming just to talk about making a difference, about, make, about the values. Some change. Yeah about the values. And that is a role that in our own ways, Gary and I both take very seriously, is that particularly as a, as a somewhat public funded enterprise here. I mean, we, we draw a fair amount of money down from the Canada Council every year. Yeah. And so I view myself as actually a public servant, except without the pension. And, um, <laughs> but, but, and then and what I that's mean by that- That's, that's your backlist. That's my backlist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad that you value my backlist. <laughs> Um, well, that's the problem, though. A lot of it, you don't get, you see any of that money because it's second hand. But I view my responsibility is to be available and to be present and thinking yeah. and engaged. And so the number of people, not just students coming through wanting to be writers, there's no end of those. And people want to be book designers, there's no end of those. And that's great. And you, you do what you can to kind of like just tempt them out of the safety of their ideas to try something mm. and to take a risk. But there's this other sort of class of people that, that, you know, we've made ourselves available to who are people who are trying to understand the community and how to be in it and how to function in it and, and um, how to have a positive influence on it. And um, I put a lot of time in it at, uh, at 
council meetings, <laughs> sitting quietly yeah. taking notes, you know, mm-hmm. so that I can be that help, so that I can say to the person that has miss, you know, has come when it's two steps too late and things are already out of hand and they're angry and they're just yelling at people. Yeah. To be able to say, hey, why don't you come have a chat and to talk about, well, you got to build support. Well, and you're giving them a voice. It may not be a loud voice, but you're giving, you're allowing them to air their voice in a, in a beautiful format. Well, to try to help them to uh, understand I believe in the process. Mm. I believe in justice. I believe in the communities that we can have if we choose to have them. And as much as money interests do run the show, as you say, they don't run it well without our dollars. And so the choices that we make as citizens and as consumers have a huge impact on how easy that goes for them and on how healthy our communities will be. So if we can spend a dollar with someone who we know shares our values and also shares our fate in our own community. And we're never going to like, you know, no one's going to start manufacturing cars in Kenville. It's not going to happen, no. but I can buy, uh, I can buy bacon from someone that raised a hog here. Right. Like it. So there's things you can do to strengthen your community and to d- diminish the kind of hold that, that those that would have, unfair and outsized influence wield but and it all starts again with showing up paying attention you yeah. know, finding how to think and how to talk about these things to each other and mm-hmm. that's what literature ultimately is about it's a kind of political act without the bullhorn and the yelling <laughs> <laughs> i i don't want to go hard on joe biden or no. trudeau or anyone else i no. mean I, those are it's a hard job and um what what worries me is that we can't attract better people sometimes. And again, that's not to say that they're not good people, but I I do worry that we can't attract the range of people and the range of thinking that we need. Our biggest failure is actually not economic. Usually it's one of imagination, being able to see the way forward and to um, believe that we can take it. That's where the failure often is. But now I'm just preaching. (laughs) Well, that's your Baptist upbringing. That's my Baptist upbringing, deep. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Oh, listen, it was a pleasure to see you. Andrew Steves is the co-founder of Gaspro Press, based in Kentville, New Nova Scotia. <laughs> no, I am. That's huge. Yeah, yeah. That's huge. It's okay. It's okay. Kent, Same uh, watershed. Kent, Kentville, Nova Scotia. And your website is? Uh, just gaspro.com. And we're on Instagram. It's a good place to see what we're up to. Very good. Thanks again. Yeah, great.